Well, welcome everybody. We at the Documentary Heritage and Preservation Services for New York, thank you for joining us today. Our topic for about the next hour, maybe a little less, is accessioning the very basics of how to accession a collection of records, including how to newly accession those already in-house and how to keep them all straight. Our topic is so exciting that the term insists on a red exclamation mark. Yours truly, I am an archivist with 16 years experience in the field, mostly not-for-profit institutions, museums, and a touch of state government work. I have had a prior career in vertebrate paleontology, which is how I discovered archives in the first place. It's a pleasure to present for Dipsy today, and I'm delighted to have you guys along for the session. Documentary Heritage and Preservation Services for New York, DIPSNY, in case you haven't heard the acronym, is a statewide program that supports people just like you, a vast network of unique library and archival repositories that safeguard New York's historical records. Like this webinar, DIPSNY provides a range of free services, always free, to eligible cultural institutions, and we absolutely encourage you to check out their website, which has a wealth of resources, including every webinar that they've delivered is right there online for you. As with all educational opportunities provided by DIPSNY, our target audiences are the staff, volunteers, and other professionals of the 4,000 plus not-for-profit institutions throughout the Empire State that collect and make available unique recorded information. And I'm talking to you, smaller repositories, usually with limited staff, often part-time, often volunteer. Anyone who's looking for a very basic review and a sprinkling of do's and don'ts, all are welcome, whether you fit that audience or not. And I hope um, this sounds like some of you out there already. If your repository has any of these listed qualities, or all, as in the New York State Archives pictured, I'm going to stop you right here and suggest this webinar may not be for you, but you're most welcome to attend. 26 miles of records, a proprietary barcode system, an archivist in charge of accessioning, 35 archivists on a staff of about 70 employees, dozens of book trucks in use at all times, and fleets of researchers in the reading room six days a week. We have a very short, dizzying tour of the State Archives with my excellent colleague, John Diefenderfer, and hopefully this will load. If not, we'll just move on. Okay. Suffice it to say that there are stacks upon stacks upon stacks with billions of records right here in the State Archives. Um, probably not what you're looking at, in your own repository. So we'll get back to the program. Uh, we're going to review some basic terms that pertain to archives management. All definitions that you'll see here today are pulled from the Society of American Archivists online glossary. The whole ever-expanding thing is on the SAA website, that's Society of American Archivists. In terms of resources that I mentioned today, once this um, program is posted online, which will be maybe a week or so, you'll also automatically see any resources that I've mentioned, so you don't have to take furious notes. Appraisal is the process of determining if the records hold permanent archival value. Acquisition, materials are received by a repository as a unit. Accession, today's topic, which we're going to define shortly. Accrual, an additional group of records that belong to an acquisition, also called an accretion. Arrangement, the act of organizing a set of records according to the archival principles of provenance and original order. Access, the ability to locate, retrieve, and ultimately use the collections, which I always like to point out is the reason archives exist. Archives exist to be used. Accession is both a noun and a verb. The noun describes materials physically 
and legally transferred to a repository as a unit at a single time, also called an acquisition. The verb to accession is to take legal and physical custody of a group of records or other materials and to formal, formally document their receipt. The verb also is to document the transfer of records in a register, a database, or other log of the repository's holdings. So it's two verbs. One is to take custody and the other is to document that custody. That's what we're going to discuss today. Sounds easy and is easy. At the basic level, let me stress. The Society of American Archivists adds these notes to its definition of accession. The materials may be acquired by gift, bequest, purchase, transfer, retention schedule, or statute. An accession may be part of a larger, already existing collection. An accession added to existing collections is sometimes called an accretion or an accrual. Accession should be distinguished from acquisition as nouns. The SAA reminds us they are synonymous, but the verb accession goes far beyond the sense of acquire, connoting the initial steps of processing by establishing rudimentary physical and intellectual control over the materials, as we mentioned, by entering information in some kind of database. Yes, the word control. If you're an archivist, you've already come to terms with this. If you're new to the field, we're all about control. It's a good time to mention that archivists and others working with records are and need to be control freaks. We spend a lot of time and effort establishing, preserving, documenting, and otherwise imposing control on the records in our care. Intellectual control is obtained through the creation of catalogs, finding aids, or other guides that enable researchers and staff to locate materials of interest. Physical control is obtained through documenting and tracking the storage of records to ensure they can be located. Basic accessioning procedures kick off these controls from the moment of acquisition. I still think it would be nice if we could simply spritz this stuff all over the collection and gain control that way. Any discussion of accessioning begins with the legal agreement to transfer physical and intellectual custody of the records from the owner to the repository. The deed of gift agreement is used when a donor owns the collection, and a transfer agreement is used if the materials are to be moved from one unit or department to another in the same institution. For our purposes today, we will review the deed of gift agreement since gifts are a very common way that smaller repositories acquire material. So a deed of gift is a legal document. It is an agreement transferring title or ownership to the property without an exchange of monetary compensation. In archives, deeds of gifts frequently take the form of a contract establishing conditions governing that transfer of title and specifying any restrictions the donor may have on access and use. The deed of gift is a legal contract where the donor and archivist spell out their agreed upon conditions that will govern this access and use. Archivists strive to have few restrictions, preferably none, on any collection, but in order to obtain the material, we need to come to terms with the donor and their wishes for privacy or confidentiality. These terms might be restrictions on a time base, such as the collection is closed until 20 years after the donor's death, or it may um, hinge on the nature of certain materials, such as the copyright to all photographs remains with the donor until her death or the year 2025, whichever comes first. To keep, tr try to keep any restrictions reasonable when you're negotiating with a donor and avoid the quote, closed for 100 years clause. Also make sure the deed does not exclude the archivist from looking at the materials. Believe it or not, I know that this has happened. And remember, without access to the materials, they might as well be locked away in a warehouse. So that's what we're trying to avoid. Access is key. I love this quip by well-known archivist Gerald Hamm. 
donor agreements cannot become the dead hand of the past. They must contain some option for reappraisal and deaccessioning. Deaccessioning is a topic for another day, actually, January 20, sorry, January 31st to be precise, when Dipsney will present the webinar Policies and Procedures for Deaccessioning. Deaccessioning can be fraught, emotional, controversial, and often is performed in the dark of night. Well, I'm kidding about that, but here are a few titles in the archives literature that set the tone for the subject. But you promised. I've deaccessioned and lived to tell about it. Invitation to a bonfire. Experiments in deaccessioning and controversy and collections. We'll leave it at this. An essential aspect that underlies accessioning is basic stewardship responsibilities. For any potential donation, always determine if the collection fits within your institution's mission and collection policy. If your museum collects only salt shakers, then the most exciting collection of pepper grinders is offered to your archive. Is that really appropriate for you to acquire? These overlapping circles of space, time, and resources must remind us to set aside our personal interests, say, in Pepper, and, into, and remember that every collection that we bring into our repository will consume space to examine, space to study, space to properly store, staff time to process, and staff time to make available to researchers, and other resources such as funding for preservation supplies or conservation treatments. If the collection on offer does fit within your mission, and you have the ability to acquire and care for it by all means. The Code of Ethics for Archivists produced by the Society of American Archivists mentions that we should turn down a collection if it is a far better fit at another repository. The code makes for good reading, by the way, and ethics will be addressed in a forthcoming Dipsney webinar on March 21st of this year. Back to the deed of gift, just like any gift, a gift of material to an archive requires three components to an act. One, a clear offer by the donor, a clear offer. That does not mean a doorstep donation left in the dark of night. And I too, you guys probably too, know that that actually does happen. Second, a deed of gift requires acceptance of the offer by the archives or repository. Just because somebody wants to give it doesn't mean the archives wants to accession it. The acceptance here is, offer, is indicated by the dog's wagging tail. And third element of the process of establishing a gift is physically the transfer of the collection to the archives. The Society of American Archivists website details the purpose and elements of the deed of gift agreement and I recommend a thorough read of that if you are unfamiliar with the deed of gift. And uh, the I have to credit Mutt's comics for the fair use in, um, fair use use of Mooch the cat and Earl the dog. Now that we own the new collection outright and have the material in hand we are finally ready to accession it. Accessioning is typically done as close to the acquisition date as possible with new collections. However, retroactive accessioning is perfectly fine for items that are either found in collections, unaccessioned, or those that have an older, possibly outdated or superseded accessioning system. Think, for example, a lot of mid 20th century and early 20th century materials had just a two digit year, like instead of the year 1964 being associated with the item, it would just say 64. So institutions like that, for the most part, might have um, updated their systems. We're going to talk about how to do that. There is nothing wrong with implementing a new accessioning system. Just keep track of the old, keep any legacy numbers permanently linked to the collection. So you can update it, but never, never Eliminate old numbers, scratch off old numbers, cut tags, keep it all as is, just enhance it with your new accession number. So what follows is a very basic protocol that applies to newly acquired material as well as to collections already in your care. 
Here you see a blank accession form available from the New York State Archives, and there are also a number of sources for samples. They pretty much contain the same essential elements and can be modified to your organization's needs. It's perfectly fine to handwrite your accession forms or use whatever software or online systems work best for you. Here's an easy numbering system that we're going to talk about at length today that you can implement immediately. You can see it in the upper left hand corner under accession number. A four digit year followed by a dot or a dash or whatever you like. A three digit collection number followed by if needed another three digit number if you have a collection that actually merits more item level. That's possibly more common with art or museum objects. In this example, 2019, the year the collection is accessioned, not necessarily the year it was acquired or the year it was created, rather the year you finally had the resources to accession the material or reaccession. 2019 001, the first collection accessioned in 2019. In this example, the legacy collection number is box one. And I've included that on this new form, upper right hand corner. The next collection to be accessioned, regardless of what it is or where it came from, is 2019-002. Keep going throughout the year as you accession items. And then when the new year arrives, simply start the next accession at 2020-001. I did promise this was a basic review. I hope I'm meeting your expectations. Here in this example, the current system in a small local public library's archival collection labels a collection by its box number. Thus, the Bryant collection is box one. The Hasbrook family collection, specifically one item, that is Charlotte's needlepoint sampler, is known as box four. You can see collections box two, three, four, and box five here. Notice the simple location device of unit and shelf numbering that uh, uh, we've added at the bottom. That's the first shelf in the first unit. Physical control, remember? In this example, we will newly accession each of the collections we just viewed. Be sure to capture the following elements for each accession. Accession number and date, old or legacy numbers or letters or whatever you might have on the prior, prior system, collection title and dates of the collection, the donor names, any quick administrative notes about the deed of gift, such as was the deed of gift sent, what date was it sent, and so forth. Was the acknowledgement of thanks sent, which usually includes a, a way to issue the tax information for the donor. Uh, we also want to see if there's any restrictions. And if none, every researcher loves to see the phrase, quote, collection is open for research. But on your accession form, you would list any, any restrictions um, that you've agreed to. You'll need to add a description of the collection, even if brief, and this is very important. More detail now is always better, but at least capture the overarching gist of the collection as here. Uh, that first one is actually for Marble Town school records and local business ledgers of the early, well, actually 1795 through 1956. You'll want to list formats of materials and as many as you can determine exist in there. Uh, for example, paper, uh, photographs, film reels, whatever you can see at your accessioning. And uh, it's nice to have a general condition of the collection. Very general. Oh. Hmm. <laughs> I'm testing that microphone. Are we back? I don't want anyone to miss a single word of what I have to say. Okay. Um, you'll need to add uh, any formats. I'm just backing up a minute here. 
any formats of papers or materials in, in your collection, be it film or photographs, and a general condition note like fine, good, or mold damage or water damage, or the worst, hopefully you never see, is active mold problem. You can use a general notes section for anything else that you'd like forever associated with this accession. Uh, quick testing, testing, can y'all hear me? Okay, thank you. Moving right along. My third up example here is 2019 -003. It illustrates the flexibility of this simple system, for it includes both legacy box number three and box number four. When a repository uses a box or container number as an accession number, they can get stuck if accruals uh, arrive, say an accrual is added. We've got the Bryant collection and then lo and behold, the Bryant family donate a new batch of records. We'd like to keep them as an accretion to that related accession. So um, the point is, if you use the 2019-003 accession number, it is not limited by container in any way. It can encompass however many boxes or files or microfilm reels. As long as, long as the old numbers are connected to the new, absolutely nothing is lost going to answer a question from Antonia. She asks, do you include the unit and shelf number on this form? I do not. That is irrelevant. You're just bringing in the collection in an accession form. You may have no clue where you're going to put it, so that is not needed on an accession form. But it will be in your other registers that you have for physical control, C collection lists or inventories. And take a look at the top accession sheet, sheet here, which I have numbered 2019-004, the General V. Hasbrook collection, also known currently as Legacy Box 5. For this project, we've made it 2019-004. If we applied the new accession number of 2019-004 to the General Sherman v. Hasbrook collection, it would encompass what are now accessioned in this small library as boxes 5 through 13. Instead of collections boxes 5 through 13, they would become united by provenance, of course, as accession 2019-004 box 1 of 9. As you see on the left, my new numbering, 2019-004 box 2 of 9, 3 of 9, and so forth. In this particular archive, the staff added a unique barcode to each box listed at the right. Be sure to transcribe these numbers onto the new accession form in order to link the old with the new, old system with the new. In this example here, going further down the list, uh, box 14 could become 2019-005 the Dwight collection, and there's box one of one. Boxes currently known as 15 and 16, the Brink family collection become 2019-006, boxes one and two. Uh, I, I realize this is basic, but I, I hope it's helpful. Um, we can now see that the third example highlighted here could become box 2019 uh, whoop, 007 is supposed to say, not 005. That's a good point. You don't want to repeat accession numbers like I did on this slide, so don't do that. <laughs> box 29, uh, collection 2019 007, the Canteen Family Collections, boxes 1, 2, and 3. If we applied this type of new accessioning number sy numbering system to the oral hi history collection seen here, we would have, instead of oral history, box 35, A, B, C, D, E, and F, we would have collection 2019 -015, or whatever the next free number is, of course. From here, we would have collection 2019 
box one of six, two of six, three of six, and so on. If these boxes are full of cassette tapes that comprise this collection, you could then use the three digits at the end, as I've typed in the bottom there. So 2019-015 is the oral history collection, whereas item within that 001 is the interview with X, 002 is the interview with Y, and 003 is the interview with Z. That's a really clean example of where you could use the three-part accession number. We transfer the legacy numbers of boxes 35, C, D, and E to the new accession sheet, of course. I think you already understand that. And I hope you see this accessioning system is very flexible and poses no limit on number of containers, be they boxers, boxes, folders, or items. Assuming provenance links these items, you can likely see that a unique collection number for these Civil War materials would unite them. For example, 2019-045 Civil War memorabilia. And then using the tripartite system again, 001 is the drum that's wrapped in the top shelf. 002 is the first belt in the next box. 003 is the next belt. And 004 is the third belt in box 78. Same thing here with a film collection. If one related acquisition, then the collection number would cover it all, such as 2019-077, the film collection. Again, using the tripartite, 001 is film X, 002, film Y, and so on. Or, as on the right-hand side of the screen, if the items are unrelated, then just proceed with the next accession number per item. So 2019-077 is film X, 2019-078 is film Y, and so forth. Let's jump back to our Bryant collection, Legacy Box 1, which we're now calling 2019-001. It is a lovely set of manuscript receipts and ledgers, mostly from the early 19th century. We will transfer them from current housing to acid-free folders and utilize our new accession number on each folder if we were to process, that is to say, rehouse, arrange, and describe the materials. A quick jump to the question, Marshall Smith asks, how do you decide when to use extended accession numbers within an archival collection? What if a box contains several land deeds, old letters, some photos, etc.? Great question. We seldom have the chance in our busy archives world to get down to that item level. So I would raise my sights and say I'd use that tripartite system if it's a very clear and simple, like I said, bunch of like 99 cassette tapes that all belong to accession number such and such, then the tripartite is really handy. It kind of acts like a folder even. I've used it myself on oversized works of art on paper from one um, donor. So imagine 50 watercolors of waterfowl donated to your collection, give it the accession number, and then each of the 50 items would become that third tripartite. So say it's collection 2019-033, that unites the whole 50 artwork pieces, with 001 being Waterfell, the first one, 002 being the Grebes, 003 being the Canada geese, and so forth. I hope that answers your question. Would that denote a subcollection? Uh, yeah, it it certainly could and does. Um, that that's definitely a little deeper if you have the time and ability. Sure, you can call it a series, a subcollection. I think. Thank you. Back to the Bryant collection seen here. Uh, a quick refoldering, and there we go. The folder states I've highlighted in red, the collection number 2019-001, that always links back to the accession number. The Bryant collection is listed on the folder. The contents, here you see trustees minutes school book, that's on the folder. The file number, I've written file four on the folder in back, file three in front and uh, the date range, so you can see 1822. That's a lot of material to put on a very little bit of folder space, so I call it 
you know, very valuable real estate on a folder, but I always want to see the collection number on there. It's one thing to say Bryant collection. Um, imagine if you have 50 collections um, and maybe multiple Bryants. You want to make sure at the end of your researcher visit, 2019-001 file three, you actually box one file three gets returned to where it needs to be. A close-up of file four, the accession number 2019-001 is written on whatever folder space you have, and in this case, I put it on the front panel, so it's not visible in this photo. All these labels help us keep control, control, control. Collection 2019-001, box one, file three, file four, ready for research. You can see that I like to use pencil for those elements that could potentially change. A box and file number could change if you move them for some reason. Or if you determine there's too much stuff in file three, you're going to bust it out into a new file, into two files. So never use something like file 3A. Just erase file four all the way back to the end of the box and renumber. So three, four, five, all the way back. Here is the newly reaccessioned Bryant Collection 2019-001, formerly cataloged as Box 1. Obviously, this is just a draft I prepared. It's a sticky note, which are not archival and really not great for your collections, but they're super handy for when you're actually processing or working on a collection for their temporary nature. Note with the new accession system, we do not label the contents on the box, just the accession number, repository, and container number here, box one of one. More useful, or you could possibly imagine its use if it's like box 33 out of 77. Oh, very nice. Jessica Johnson asks, shouldn't you add a file number with an end number? Uh, yeah, box. Well, Okay, I do that with boxes, meaning box one of nine, box two of nine, box three of nine. Yeah, it's awesome if you can do that with your files. Uh, if certainly a very easy, nice job for a volunteer uh, to go through and add that number in pencil to all the files in your box. And what Jessica's suggesting is box, sorry, excuse me, file one of more likely 33 in a box, file two of 33. Yeah, you can absolutely do that. The more information you have time to compile and compose together, the better for everybody. Control. I like it, Jessica. Um, Allison asks, with regard to retroactive accessioning, if you were to start establishing a control of institutional historical records, would you go ahead and treat the entire existing collection as a new accession? No, I would not. I would respect whatever collections are already as collections. Just give them the new numbering system as those collections. Let me know if uh, you need anything further on that. So back to uh, the image in front of you. Uh, you will, your final sticker or whatever label you use will have your repository's address and so forth. A little more detail than I could fit on sticky. But I want to point out. Um, we do not label the contents on the box label. No longer does it say the Bryant collection. Just the accession number, repository, and container number. And this is called blind labeling, as it does not allow anyone, volunteer, staff, researcher, or passerby, to know the contents by reading the label. It's a, considered a wise security measure. Instead of a label reading, quote, oldest document in Ulster County, quote, we would see only collection 2019-067, so not quite the same appeal. Quickly jumping to your questions. You know what? Uh, I think I better proceed and get back to those questions, if you guys don't mind. So keep them coming, and we definitely have time for Q&A. Please keep them coming. Thank you, guys. Okay, here is a key component. You are looking at a key component to all that we've discussed today, and it's called the control file. What do we do with all those accession sheets? Easy. We create 
a unique folder that will hold the accession sheet plus any and all current, past, and future documentation about that particular collection. These folders are placed together in a control file, sometimes called a master file or an accession file. These materials are never placed within the collection itself, where a researcher or anyone else might possibly encounter sensitive information, such as a donor's address or the fiscal value of materials, raising you know, security alarms, or anything else that's not for public consumption. Control files are, for the most part, restricted to staff. They're confidential. They're not part of the documents that um, you are archiving. They do have permanent value, but they're in your domain. They're not for the researchers. In this example, we see the accession sheet to the left um, and then scattered throughout fiscal appraisal, donors' notes on the provenance of the collection, copies of the library director's correspondence with the donors, the deed of gift is in there, and a few handwritten bits of information. Literally anything about the collection. Be sure to add any existing or legacy finding aids. This is the finding aid to box one. Excellent, all those subjects, all those access points, we don't want to lose that. So that goes right into the control file. Intellectual control, don't you love it? Here's an example of a control file or master file. Now yours will have more than one folder in it. The State Archives, for example, has a bank of file cabinets full with master files. Um, control files will always contain the deed of gift agreement or however the materials came into your collection, transfer, purchase, all that. And the accession sheet, so the deed of gift and the accession sheet as a minimum. Other documents might be added through time, loan information sheets, conservation treatment, research publications on the subject, details of any accretions, documentation that link the archives to other collections, notes of any weeding or deaccessioning, or perhaps grant-related research or other work on that collection. Just drop it in your control file. Also keep a running list of each year's accessions by number and by title. This could be sophisticated and digital or written with a humble pen, whatever your resources allow. I have worked at a small archive that lacked any kind of software for accessions, so I started out with a handwritten list and it never failed. I also have worked at an archive where a huge number of collections had never been accessioned. We dove in to impose control and started with the number 2010-001. Obviously, that's the year I worked there. There were a couple hundred collections to accession, so the three-digit number allowed a lot of room for this. Remember, the accession number is just like a catalog number. It's not meant to relate to the collection per se in any way. I've known curators who wanted all works of art to be grouped together with sequential accession numbers. They also wanted to reserve a set of numbers for future accessioning of, say, all photographic collections. I wish to stress that we must not be beholden to the accession numbers like that. If one collected artifacts and cataloged each one, one would not in the 21st century demand that all clay shards ever to be collected must fit between numbers 100 and 199 and all glass fragments you know get numbers 200 to 299 it isn't logical or practical or necessary however I did once break that rule I was the archivist at a museum where the real James Bond renowned ornithologist of the mid 20th century and author of birds of the West Indies had worked his papers were part of the hundreds of backlogged collections we accessioned in 2010. Naturally, his papers had to be accessioned as 2010-007. And let's not kid ourselves, you would have done the exact same thing. Let's jump quickly to processing. You'll see I have some points to make. <laughs> Thank you, Marshall. <sighs> Processing is the arrangement, description, and housing of archival materials for storage and use by patrons and staff. Uh, but the use by patrons we call reference, and that's beyond the scope of this webinar, and is, in my opinion, both the most challenging and the most rewarding aspect. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Thank you. 
So reference is uh, is challenging because you're dealing with the public and you've got to watch them like a hawk and you're terrified they're going to steal or break something anyway. That's also the reason we do any of what we do so that the archives can be used. So let's get back quickly to processing. Our photo here shows a processor elbow deep in that activity. It's often a contemplative and quiet endeavor. It also requires attention to detail. And again, that worthy goal, control. A collective term, processing is a collective term used in archival administration that refers to any activity, well, to the basic activities required to gain control of those records, accessioning, arrangement, culling or deaccessioning, boxing, labeling, description, preservation, and conservation. All of these tasks are important and all consume time, supplies, space, and human resources. Processing is rewarding on its own, but more so if you have a bright colleague to bounce questions and ideas around with. Not only does it provide a sense of accomplishment for the processor, it provides much improved storage for the collections in the form of physical support and chemical inertness. Likely these two archivists are discussing the latest issue of American Archivists or the finer points of arrangement and description while they rehouse early 20th century geology field notes. I will take this opportunity to point out a good practice in practice. If you look to the back of the room, all of the drinks these gals are enjoying are separate from the collection and stored in a tray. Processing. Oh, through the years working with interns, graduate students, and newly minted archivists, I often hear this and have thought it myself, but I just want to work in the back with the papers. Yeah, we all do. Ah, to leisurely refolder each file, to describe material to the folder, or heck, item level, to rehouse in brand new acid-free folders, acid-free boxes, to remove old paper clips. Look at all that control to savor the debris pile of superseded files at the end of a processing session. It's so rewarding. However, if you've been an archivist for a while, you'll know this phrase, more product, less process, MPLP for short. Archivist Mark Green and Dennis Meisner issued a striking call to archivists in 2005 to, quote, rethink the way they process collections, particularly large contemporary collections. In case you think I've dropped down into a rabbit hole of processing, I will bring it right back around to accessioning in a minute. Green and Meisner wrote, put very simply, processing is not keeping up with the acquisitions and has not been for decades, resulting in massive backlogs of inaccessible collections at repositories across the country. It should be dismaying to realize that our profession has been struggling with backlogs for at least 60 years. Backlogs are continuing to grow and are weakening the archival profession. Did you know that? They write, truly, much of what passes for arrangement and processing work is really just overzealous housekeeping writ large. Our professional fastidiousness has encouraged a widespread fixation on tasks that do not need to be performed. Good processing is done with a shovel, not with tweezers. This is such a great image to keep in mind when we approach processing. I love the statement that Green and Meisner suggest plays out in all the task areas that make up archival processing. We must get beyond our absurd overcautiousness that unprocessed collections might harbor embarrassing material not accounted for in the deeds of gift. We must stop fretting over what users might think about us if given a dirty, disorganized collection. In fact, they write, their thoughts will be paeons of praise compared to what they now think about us after being denied access to so much of our holdings. The minimum goal, Green and Meissner, like other archivists and administrators, have recently suggested, you know, recent last turn of the last century, 20th century and into our century, have suggested that the minimum and therefore likely obtainable goal for all processing is to create an accession level description for every collection. We've already been through the basic elements of accessioning forms, so you know what level we're talking about when we say accession level description for every collection. Green and Meisner presented their call to archivists 13 years ago with clarity, eloquence, and obviously wit. I strongly encourage new archivists to read their paper and remind others to refresh their perspective if they feel a bit bogged down. Shortly after MPLP, 
more product, less processing, shook the archives profession, we see a follow-up call to mesh some of that minimal processing work right up front with accessioning tasks. Christine Weideman, a highly accomplished archivist and administrator, put Green and Meisner's more product, less process to the test. Her article, Accessioning as Processing, published one year after MPLP arrived, outlined how her team used the principles of MPLP to reduce the amount of time to accession and process collections. Another excellent article, New and Seasoned Archivists May Enjoy Anew or Again, Accessioning as Processing relays the author's results when she applied MPLP processing standards to her, collect, her accessioning activities. She wrote, accessioning as processing is the goal. During the accessioning process, we arrange and describe the materials so that they are ready for research use and never enter our backlog. In short, we apply processing standards such as those recommended by Green and Meissner during the accessioning process. Now we spend a little extra time during the accessioning process and often end up with a collection that's ready for research quickly. We no longer need to expect ourselves to refolder the contents of each file and painstakingly rewrite the contents on the new acid-free folder. If the folder still supports the contents, keep it and move on. Not as pretty, but those days are over. At accessioning, we can speedily lose the bulk of unnecessary containers, such as this 1980s three-ring binder. Not for beauty's sake, rather for real estate on the shelf. Hope you can see this uh, example. Each of the binders on the left is practically four inches at the spine, four inches wide. A quick busting out of the contents and foldering them in sequence occupies about 2.5 inches. A worthwhile gain? If your collections were replete with four inch wide binders, I'd say yes. This archivist will have gained easily 20 shelf inches when this speedy task is complete. Yes, at accessioning, we can make bold decisions to rapidly unload any massively unwieldy, inappropriate, or purloined containers. A quick reboxing at accessioning, not refoldering, just reboxing will relieve the pressure on these aerial photographs and make the collection accessible to researchers. Can you see, these are two boxes side by side that are just bursting. They can't even sit on the shelf neatly together, these boxes, because they're ripped at the seams and totally overstuffed. Yes, this type of upgrade is likely to expand the collection's footprint, but that will balance out in the end with the following example speedy recognition and elimination of duplicates, or in this case, multiplicates and multiplicates of items. Archivists typically, typically save two of any printed item, maybe three, really up to you, but we certainly don't need this many of any modern document. In a matter of minutes, we've identified two from each of that set and saved ourselves easily 21 inches of shelf space. This is very satisfying, possibly more so than over-processing a collection, and it's completely legit. I'm going to end on this mental high, and we'll open up back to Q&A, questions and answers. Three very special thanks I must acknowledge. Kathleen Bonk, museum technician, geology department in the New York State Museum. Jody Ford, director of the Stone Ridge Library in Ulster County, who allowed me to use her collection for the examples of renumbering, and John Diefenderfer for sharing his for sharing his collections and expertise, all three of them. And thank you for choosing to spend your time with us at the Documentary Heritage and Preservation Services for New York. We hope to see you again. And now let's jump back to those questions. Jumping up to Allison Robbins. Um, oh, sorry, up a little higher. Just scrolling up, here we go. Allison Robbins asks, with regard to retroactive accessioning, if you were, oh, I answered that one. Dina Schwimmer asks, why again would you not insert a folder 2A versus renumbering? It's not ideal, but can it, it can result in a lot less work. 
you're absolutely right, Dina. It is not ideal, and it can result in a lot less work. But oh, through experience, I've just seen so many issues where no one knew there was a folder 2A. There's a folder 2 and a folder 3. So imagine after a research visit, you're putting your folder, you're making sure every folder is accounted for. How would you know, maybe through the finding aid, but typically after a research visit, archivists were busy putting things away. And we would not know that there was a folder 2A missing because it's not sequential. I can give an example from the state archives where I previously worked, we had different scale, believe me, um, close to 420 pound ledgers of written materials, 400, pre-1847, I believe. Um, these were uh, all, let's say 398 of them. We knew that they were there, we numbered them anew with, with a label on the outside of the container, so 1 through 397, and then um, I can't remember exactly the sequence of events, but we realized there was a book 88A. So, it, whoa, okay, that changes things. If we went back to renumber um, every single box label, that's 398 box labels to generate, and again, with the 88A, in my thinking, at least if you're going to do that, change 88 to 88A, and the next folder is 88B. But yeah, we had to completely reorganize. We decided to put book 88A at the end of the collection, since uh, that way we could continue have each volume number match its container number, which is just a nice thing to do, not necessary. But when you have 398 volumes, it's nice to have the label match the volume rather than being a one-off. Okay, I hope that answers some of that. Do you advise placing location where stored on the box, such as shelf number? Uh, yeah, I f yeah, definitely. I know a huge place like the State Archives, whenever a box is pulled, the clerks will write on that box in pencil, this came from shelf, you know, 99, row 99, shelf 7. And that way, when they put it back, they just look at what they wrote when they pulled it, easily done, back to unit 99, shelf 7. Um, that's great. Uh, also, I would use pencil for that because you never know, some things might change around. Do... Um, because there are only 26 letters. I'm sorry, Jessica, I'm not sure I knew what you meant by that. If you want to read, expand that question. Allison says, to expand, no existing numbers, et cetera, just the records and boxes as gathered. This would be the first system of control ever used for them. Fantastic, nice and clean. Go for it, 2019, 001, you've got your number ready for you. Okay, Allison, good. Does anyone else have any questions? We've got a few minutes. I'm going to see some people are typing, so we'll just give it a moment. You can see Dipsney, the website is dipsney.org. Please check out their list of recorded webinars collection security, um, grant writing, oh my gosh, how to deal with damaged collections, all about mold, nice title called Demystify, excuse me, Demystifying Cold and Frozen Storage. And also, Dipsney offers workshops around the great state. So keep track of their calendar, because if they're anywhere near you, their services, again, always free, totally worthwhile attending. They're run by absolute professionals. And okay, any any more questions? Yep. Michelle says, I agree with the shovel approach, but as a conservator, <clears throat> uh-oh, when someone comes and asks for conservation services for a collection, if individual articles don't have a unique identifier, I cannot keep track of them in the lab. So perhaps the tweezer approach can be applied when conservation is a likelihood. Oh, absolutely. 
Absolutely. Conservation, I would say, for the most part, is an item level task. You may have multiple items, but every item literally will be treated. So definitely use the tweezers, whatever other tools conservators use. And um, you can also put a, a temporary number to relate to your item. Um, It's also, to be fair, it's fun to use a tweezer in processing, but it really doesn't get the records out there any faster. Jessica, how does accession number fit into series and subseries? Uh, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't actually pertain. It, it covers them. Put it that way. The accession number covers the whole collection. If you never get a chance to describe them to subseries, that's fine. The collection number covers all, let's say, 33 boxes of materials. Um, series and subseries is an intellectual pursuit to make material more knowable for researchers. And yes, since description follows arrangement, um, arrangement does make things physically easier. So you've got your, say, a series of invoices for fuel bills of 1899. Um, you definitely, uh, oops, I lost Jessica's, oh yeah, subseries. Um, it doesn't matter. The, your series and subseries, however fine or broad you want your finding aid to be, the accession number covers that one collection. Elizabeth, do you write the accession number in pencil on a paper document, photo, map, etc.? You can. You absolutely can if that is how you or your trustees or your conservators, um, whoever you're working with and for, if they're comfortable with that, by all means. I love it. I love using a pencil and throwing an accession number on the back. It's usually fairly obvious that it's not part of the document. You want to make sure you don't do that on like a valuable document. You don't want to deface anything. But for, for more modern records, if you're dealing with bulk, yeah, why not? Uh, other people may disagree, but if you're making that decision, you decide. Jessica, most boxes with folders are sequential. Label the folders with two of six or two of six is not that time consuming. Using the alphabet, you are limited to 26 letters. Using infinite numbers is much more realistic when you have numerous files in a box. Oh. I couldn't agree more, and I hope I conveyed that too, that it's box box three, file three, box three, file four, box three, file five, and on and on and on. I don't use letters, really. Agree with you completely. Deed of gift, how far must archivists go to determine the donor signing it is the only owner? Oh boy, I have seen that one backfire. Um, we have to have to work in an environment of trust, frankly. Um, we, if the person presenting the materials claims to be the owner, I, I, you know, I've actually read articles, I think, in American Archivist about how far to trans, sorry, to research the title of uh, copyright. And um, it's just not worth it. It's not worth it. It's not worth our time. We have to work in an environment of trust. If the person donating it turns out not to be the owner, well, the experience I had once was when a at an archive I was working in, donation of so and so's such and such papers came in. Perfect deed of gift signed by both parties, me and the donor totally legit. As far as I'm concerned, we've covered what we need to cover. But this person evidently had an angry cousin who called me and really gave me the third degree that cousin so-and-so had no right to donate those materials. They're not hers to give and so forth. But I basically, and it worked out, I basically had to say that is between you and cousin so-and-so. I have what I need for legal purposes that shows somebody, presumably the title owner, the person who claimed to be the title owner, transferred that title to the archive. It's always nice if you have a legal counsel on, on your staff. 
you can always run these things by them. But we really can't go too, too far. Michelle, hey, conservators are not that bad. Oh my gosh, I love conservators. I'm bowing in a nonverbal praise of conservators. You guys are phenomenal. Allison, another question. When dealing with historical records that are occasionally being discovered in the building, would you treat these as new accessions or accretions to the existing accession of records? Excellent question. Archivists are bound to two principles. The first of which, I mean, we're bound to a lot of things, but we have two overarching principles that answer those questions for us. Principle of provenance says that all, that a given collection must not be intermingled with another. The, let me say that better. The creator of one set of records, those records must not be intermingled with somebody else's. And I like to use the example of the papers of George Washington must not be mingle, intermingled with the papers of Abe Lincoln. Uh, yeah, they're both presidents. Yeah, they're both wartime. A lot of subjects overlapping, but we would never mix those. So when you find or discover a new a, a collection in the building, I would Certainly, there's no harm in accessioning it as its own thing, but if you find like, wow, this is the third diary, we only thought there were two of the so-and-so collection, then yeah, link it right in. It's an accretion to the existing accession. Vicki, if we have a box of binders, we would accession each binder, but would we just create a finding aid for the list of items within the binder? The binders each contain dozens of photos and documents. What is your recommendation? Well, I'm not a fan of binders. I think boxes and folders, or in the case of photos, photo sleeves, like appropriate Melanex um, inert materials, not anything with PVC or other vinyls. If, if, if your clear photo sleeve has a letter V in it, don't use it. Not good, not archival. It tends to melt right onto the photo. So I love to get rid of binders. Keep the information associated with it. Sometimes you can um, pull out, maybe there's a title that's stuck in the front of the binder. binder. Um, uh, would we create a finding aid for the list of items within the binder? Sure, sure, that's that's phenomenal. That's That would be a container list, most definitely. If you have the time or staff or the materials warrant it, yeah. Okay. And Antonia, if you add more to a collection and you have box four of six and now you have five more boxes, do you have to go back and renumber how many boxes you have or do you start a new collection? Mm, if you know it's related, I would log it as an accretion in the accession form, but I would like to see it physically together. So yes, I would add the five more boxes, I'd make space on the shelves, which could take a lot of time. Sometimes you can't. Sometimes you might have to stick those five more boxes where you do have space, but that's okay. Physically, they can be separated as long as they're intellectually related. So I would like to see that become one new collection of six plus five boxes. And yes, I would remember them, which is also why I use pencil. Uh, you could start a new collection. I know at the state archives, they give their collections are so vast they're not about to squeeze, you know, room for five more boxes and move 25 miles of materials. So they often give a new accre uh, an accretion its own number, but link it to the collection. Michelle, is there a formal system for temporary numbers that don't run the risk of interfering, or? mistaking, being mistaken as an accession number. Let me read that again. Is there a formal system for temporary numbers? Um, yeah, definitely. Whatever you, it's in, oh, sorry, formal. Formal for temporary. No, I don't think so. I think it's informal for temporary. Uh, that's why I use stickies. Um, you know, if you, if you got a collection that's 47 boxes big, and, you know, just use your sticky labels, box one through 47. And it's, 
you know, because you're accessioning it, that it belongs to collection 2019-001, but you don't need to worry about getting that accession number on all however many boxes I just mentioned until it's ready. You can, you can throw 2019-001 in pencil on every single box, just, you know, depending on the scale of your collection might be helpful. Vicki, the donor of the binders has already separated the binders by date. So if I make a pile of all the photos within each binder, I would lose the information the donor provided. Well, we certainly don't want to lose any information. But I don't like the fact that that information is contingent on the binder. In other words, if you made those binders available to a researcher, the researcher had your permission with gloves to pull out photos, maybe uh, to check what's on the back of them or, you know, whatever they might need if they have your permission. How would you, Vicki, as, as archivist, know that at the end of their research visit, just say there's one photo that they left out? And this happens too frequently, not all the time, but it does happen when a research visit is concluded and there's a document. So I just always think, would we be able to get that photo back into that binder by date? Uh, that's a very good point and something you're going to have to decide. I, I will mention something that happened at one place where I worked. Uh, at the end of a research visit, maybe a day later or hour later, the researcher came back and said, I lost my cell phone. Is it possible I left it in the reading room? And the staff looked around. Nope. Sorry, so off the researcher went. Later that day, other staff deep in the stacks heard the cell phone ringing. The researcher inadvertently <laughs> dropped his or her cell phone into the research files while studying them. Back in the box, box back on the shelf. That thing could have been gone for eternity. OK. <clears throat> Michelle, I understood. Oh, I'm so glad. Okay. Michelle wants to be consistent, but not use a method that looks like a true accession number. Understood. Bye, Marshall. Okay. Thank you, guys. Any other questions? We've just gone a little past the hour. I absolutely... Oh, okay, a couple questions typing. I'll, I, I got all the time in the world. Um, thanks for everybody. If you have to jump, jump but I'm here to the bitter end. Great questions, by the way. Thank you, Kathleen. Oh, wow, Diane, oh my gosh. I'm, I'm pleased. I'm so pleased for your kind comments about the usefulness of this webinar. And definitely take a look at those articles that we will send to all attendees. Oh yeah, the forms can be downloaded. I, I literally Googled New York State Archives um, sample accessioning form uh, for the one I showed you. They're, they're also, they're just readily available. Library of Congress has them. Oh, thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Dina. The form from the State Archives is actually part of a really great project that's online called Strengthening Archives. And it's really nice in terms of all basics that that any archivist at a smaller institution needs to know. Jessica is absolutely right. Museum accessioning is different than archival accessioning. It is. Um, we can cross over, we can link, we can relate, but certainly archivists work in groups. We work in groups and groups and groups of records, the papers of George Washington, whereas museum typically, not always, but typically work with items. That glass fragment from an ancient Dutch bottle that was found in Albany. So yeah, you're absolutely right. And there's plenty of good resources on museum accessioning and its difference to archival accessioning. I'll mention one right now. It's a great book, maybe eight years old, called Mm, museum archives. We'll throw it in the resources, but there's a chapter on archival accessioning for archives, the archives of a museum, 
and a chapter on how it's different than museum accessioning. So you're absolutely right. These are different professions. Margaret, how do you keep an accession together when it consists of different types of items like textiles and documents? Excellent question. And the answer is back to that green spray bottle I showed, controls. We just need to cross-reference. So you say textile, say and that's not uncommon. You get a bunch of papers of the such and such family and you're in box three and lo and behold there's a christening gown from so-and-so who was christened in the year 1842. Yeah, uh, you if you have a textile department, you might want to indicate physically by writing and dropping, a, I call them dummy folders, it's just an old phrase, um, a, a mock folder, a holder, a placeholder that could say christening gown, box three, file seven, and then right in the file, right there on the file, relocated to textile collection, and then just make sure you can cross-reference that. Also indicate all that on that accession form or however many forms you need, drop them in your control file. And then for those who are studying textiles, they come across this beautiful christening gown and make sure there's a note physically there is fine or in the textile documentation that says christening gown 1843 belongs to and is associated with archival collection 2019-007. Oh, you guys. I'm so pleased you've learned something. So thank you.